welcome to this special Liberty Amendments Month presentation on liberty and libraries. My name is Chuck Anderson, and I, along with Steve Shannon, the Honorable Judge Steve Shannon, co-chair the Education and Speakers Committee of Liberty Amendments Month. To begin with, a big thanks to the Fairfax County Public Library for putting together this two-part program. In particular, a huge thanks to FCL research librarians Chris Barbashek and Suzanne LaPierre for sharing their work on desegregation in Northern Virginia libraries. They'll lead part one of our program. And second, another great deal of thanks goes to Fairfax County Library Director Jessica Hudson and the staff of the county's Capital Facilities Division for agreeing this afternoon or evening to unveil plans for the new Patrick Henry Library. That presentation will be part two of this program. Liberty Amendments Month would be an idea alone were it not for the indefatigable work of our Parks and Recreation staff, including Special Events Director Lily Widman and her loyal colleagues. And finally, I'd like to thank Jen Morrow and our local bookstore, Bards Alley, for providing refreshments for tonight's event. For our custom, thanks. For our custom in Vienna, I'd like to acknowledge the government officials who are with us today. First, Supervisor Walter Alcorn, who will have some words to say to introduce part two. From the Fairfax, uh, sorry, for the Vienna Town Council, Ray Brill and me. Um, the Director of Fairfax County Public Library, Jessica Hudson. Town Manager, Mercury Payton. And I think I've gotten everybody. If not, I apologize and slip me your name later and I'll put it at the end. In case you've not yet heard, Liberty Amendments Month is a four week celebration of the four constitutional amendments, the 13th, the 14th, the 15th, and the 19th that extended rights and liberties to more and more Americans. Our town manager, Mercury Payton, conceived of this celebration during the dark post-George Floyd days of 2020. He hoped that this month-long celebration, by focusing on the rights and liberties that we all enjoy, would be something that we could all unite around and just perhaps might heal some of the divisiveness in our country. This year, the Lamb Leadership Committee designated Week 2, which focuses on the 14th Amendment, as Library Week. This is the first time we've designated a week. If you could indulge me for a few moments, I'd like to make the case why liberty and libraries go hand in hand. The initial purpose behind the 14th Amendment, also known as the Due Process or the Equal Protection Clause, was to provide some legal protection for the rights and liberties of recently freed blacks in America. But the language of the 14th Amendment is so universal that it has been evoked in support of many different causes over the years. Among other just causes, desegregation sits on the broad shoulders of the 14th. That concise 52 word statement, that is the 14th is a classic example of the American practice of anchoring government in the bedrock of broad based ideas. Our nation's founders were an idea obsessed lot, immersed in the concepts of the enlightenment and natural law central to the concept of a people ruled not by force of force but force of law was the presumption that the people would have access to ideas and that is where libraries come in throughout history libraries have been the bedrock of humankind's desire to construct both a repository and a sherry point for the knowledge and ideas in some epochs such as the middle ages the storeroom aspect has been more prominent, but ultimately knowledge is useless unless it is shared. Subscription libraries were opening across the eastern seaboard of America before tea was being dumped into Boston Harbor. Our founders, especially Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, recognized and promoted the key supporting role that libraries play in free democracies. And here is the brilliance of libraries. 
As repositories of ideas, libraries are unique in that they hold the tools for fixing their own shortcomings. Somewhere within their collections sit books containing the lofty philosophical ideals of our American democracy, expositions and treatises on why all women and men are created equal. When they ail, libraries need only search their own stacks for possible cures. The need for libraries is no less urgent today. Several years ago, Deborah Fallows and Atlantic editor James Fallows set off on a multi-year quest to find the secret sauce in declining communities in America that had made remarkable comebacks. One of the common elements they found in communities like Danville, Virginia, Greenville, South Carolina, and Allentown, Pennsylvania was a vibrant community library. Patrick Henry, our local library, serves that role here, lying smack dab in the center of Vienna. Patrick Henry is always bustling with people hungry for ideas and knowledge. A Patrick Henry-less Vienna would be a much poorer place. Not that libraries are always reflections of what is best in our society. They are human institutions mirroring at times the flaws in our own collective selves. The first part of this program, desegregation in Northern Virginia libraries, focuses on one of those dark times and the courageous individuals who opened these vital public institutions to people of all race. In an age of growing misinformation, open and accessible libraries remain extremely important to the grand American political experiment. Simply put, our, as our founders repeatedly stated, an educated and informed citizenry is a prerequisite for a functioning democracy. In part two of this program, we'll get a glimpse of Vienna's public library for the next half century. We all look forward to seeing those future concepts, but first, let's see how we got here today. Let me say a few things about our two authors. Chris Barbashek is a Fairfax County native. His day job is archivist librarian in Fairfax County's Virginia Room, where he assists academics and the public in assessing the rich historical records of our great county. And if you haven't been there, I urge you to go. It's, it's a blast. Chris has degrees in history and library science. Suzanne LaPierre is a Virginia specialist for the Fairfax County Library. She authors the Wired Library column for Public Libraries magazine. And she holds degrees in library science, museum studies, and interestingly, a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. Maybe she should help out with the design here. Both Chris and Suzanne have been recognized by one of our treasured local institutions, Historic Vienna Inc., for the research that resulted in their book, which they will now discuss, entitled Desegregation in Northern Virginia Libraries. Mr. Barbashek and Ms. LaPierre, the floor is yours. All right, good evening, everyone. Happy Liberty Amendments Month to Vienna. Uh, Suzanne and I are really excited to be here with you all to talk about the history of desegregating public libraries in Northern Virginia. So let's jump right in. How did two librarians come to write about a book about this topic? Well, it all began in April 2021. Dr. Sujitha Hampton, who was the third vice president of the Fairfax County NAACP and its education chair, was appointed a new member of the Fairfax County Library Board of Trustees. And at a retreat for new board members, she asked the question, were Fairfax County public libraries ever segregated? And if they weren't segregated, how is it possible that the school system was segregated if these libraries weren't? So our library director, who's here with us tonight, Jessica Hudson, she asked, wrote an email that you see here and asked the Virginia Room staff to dig into this question and look at it and see what was going on. In addition to what was going on in Fairfax County, she asked us to look at what was going on in Northern Virginia as a whole. So Suzanne and I, who work in the Virginia Room, as Chuck mentioned, we divvied up the research. I looked specifically at what was going on in Fairfax County, and Suzanne looked at what was going on at the other Northern Virginia public libraries. So this is how we did it. 
with the exception of the library sit-in in Alexandria, which was a very well-known and documented case, it quickly became apparent to both of us that nobody had ever done research on segregated libraries in Northern Virginia and how they were desegregated. So we have the library records in Fairfax County for Fairfax County Public Library in the Virginia Room. We've got the Library Board of Trustees minutes going back to 1939 when the library was founded. We have correspondence. We have library bookmobile records. We have scrapbooks, oral histories, all kinds of cool stuff like that. So we dug through that to try to identify the Fairfax County story. We reached out to a lot of longtime Fairfax County residents, both black and white, to get their experiences. And then we went on some field trips. So we went to the Library of Virginia, which has a lot of library records for the whole libraries, the, all of the library, public libraries in the state of Virginia, including Fairfax County. And then we also went out to a couple of formerly segregated libraries that still exist today, or the sites of where they were segregated. That's Suzanne there in front of the Percival Public Library, which was the first library, first public library in Loudoun County to open. And then we compiled all of our research into a 100-page report, and we presented it to the library board in September 2021. And at the end of that meeting, everyone said, you got to turn this research into a book. And so we did. And we published this book in January of this year by the History Press. We did a lot more in-depth research. We looked at what was going on in Virginia as a whole and Washington, D.C. as well. So Northern Virginia was uniquely positioned between the Deep South and the relatively progressive city of Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., the public, D.C. public library system and the Library of Congress were desegregated and ostensibly open to everyone from their inception, whereas in the Deep South, the libraries there, not so much. In 1946, the Virginia General Assembly passed a law in the Virginia Code requiring that libraries who were receiving state aid had to serve all residents. And a portion of that code, the text is written on the bottom there in the slide. However, this wording was interpreted by some to mean that segregated libraries or segregated bookmobile deliveries could suffice as service to black citizens. Other Virginia libraries just completely ignored this mandate altogether and continued to only serve white inhabitants, which is why, as you can see in this table here, there is such a disparity in dates when library systems in this area desegregated. If you look at Alexandria, they didn't desegregate until 1962, but Arlington, which was the first public library in Northern Virginia to desegregate, did that in 1950. Prince William County Public Library was the only library to open desegregated. And just because these libraries said they were desegregated did not mean that there was still a lot of implicit racism going on, or if you were black living in any of these counties where you felt comfortable using the library. So, over to Suzanne, who's going to tell you about the first attempt to desegregate public library in Northern Virginia. Okay, all right. I'm going to stand up because I project my voice better if I'm standing. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so, we cannot talk about the topic of desegregation of public libraries without talking about this man here, Samuel Wilbert Tucker. He was born and raised in Alexandria, just a few miles from where we're all gathered today. And he was a young attorney who uh, had received his education in Washington, D.C. at Armstrong High School and Howard University. And then he passed the bar exam at the age of 20 by studying in the D.C. libraries that were available to him and had to wait until he was 21 years old to uh, practice law. So he was something of a prodigy. Um, in 1937, the Alexandria Library opened their first public library two blocks from his home, but it was for white residents only. So Mr. Tucker was unable to use this library that was two blocks from his home. So um, he did attempt to open an account there and was refused. So he planned a two-fold strategy that involved a lawsuit and a protest. More about the lawsuit in the book, but the protest is sometimes referred to as America's first sit-down strike. So in 1939, way ahead of his time here, he organized a group of young men to enter the library one at a time, one August day in 1939. They arrived as planned, well-dressed, well-mannered. One at a time, they approached the reference desk and asked to open a library account. 
and each one was denied because of his race. Whereupon, as planned, he pulled a book from the shelf and sat quietly at one of the tables to read. So each of the five young men did this, and um, when they declined to leave, the police were summoned and the men were arrested. Well, Tucker had foreseen this, and so he had a young lookout come and alert him when, this, um, when the police were called because he wanted the press to get photos of this because he wanted to raise awareness of the injustice of denying black residents use of the library. And that's why we have this photo today of the young man being um, let out of the library there on the right. Unfortunately, this incident did not result in the library desegregating. Um, instead, the city of Alexandria hastily built a separate library for black residents that opened less than a year later called the Robinson Library. And we will take a look at it. The next slide here. So the Robinson Library opened in 1940, and um, that's Mrs. Carr, its librarian up on top. And it was, as you can see, a little crowded there. It was much smaller and had older books than the main library. It was open fewer hours, and the librarian was paid half the salary of the white librarian on Queen Street. So this was an example of a separate but clearly unequal library. Um, when did the library finally desegregate? Not until 20 years later in phases between 1959 and 1962. Uh, first for the adults and high school students and then later for children. So if you go, you can actually go visit the Robinson Library today. It's currently a black history museum. And you can also visit the library where the sit-in took place. It's currently the Barrett branch of the Alexandria Library System. And they now have signage there um, telling you about the sit-in and recognizing the importance of, of that event. So meanwhile, what was happening over in Arlington? Well, in Arlington, um, the Arlington Public Library formally began as a part of the government in 1937. So that's the same year as Alexandria's opened. Um, but, and also, it was also for white residents. Therefore, the, uh, some of the black residents of Arlington started their own library association called the Holmes Library Association in 1940. In 1944, the Arlington Public Library um, invited them to uh, partner with them and make the Holmes Library a branch of the Arlington Public Library. And so it opened in, you can see the little, the little white building there was the library. It was the smallest of all the collections. Uh, but it, it was in the uh, Carver Holmes community, which was a community that was created for people who were, who were displaced when the Pentagon was built. Um, and it was well used. You can see the librarian and some of the children on the left. Um, however, in 1949, the government decided they were going to repurpose that land and so the library had to be torn down. The Arlington Public Library couldn't find another place for it, so they just quietly integrated in 1950. Um, but before we cheer them for being the first um, in, the, in the area to, to integrate, we don't really know that they made this known to the black residents, that they were now welcome to use any of the branches in the library system. We don't really have any evidence of that. In fact, the evidence that we do have suggests, uh, from oral histories, suggests that black residents we're not aware that they had access to the libraries because everything else was segregated, the schools and other public facilities. So um, many of them can uh, use the um, library at the, um, high, the, the high school for black students instead. Um, so it's an interesting case, I think. These two suburbs of Washington, D.C., Arlington and Alexandria, have very different stories when it comes to the, their timeline for desegregating the libraries. Um, so why did the Arlington Public Libraries desegregate in 1950 and those in Alexandria not for a decade or more later? Well, the presence of segregated libraries allowed uh, cities to forestall integration because they could say that they were still providing some service to uh, residents. Um, as Chris mentioned earlier, the law in the Code of Virginia said that libraries receiving state aid must be serving all residents. but serving all residents could mean, be interpreted to mean, well, we have a bookmobile stop or we have a segregated branch or something like that. Um, so that is uh, something we go into more in the book is the difference, the implicit um, segregation versus explicit segregation. And by now you might be thinking, well, what about Fairfax County? What about Vienna? Well, Chris is going to uh, tell us what was going on right here in Fairfax County. All right, Fairfax County. Fairfax County Public Library was established in 1939. It was predated by several pre-existing libraries, one in McLean, one in Herndon, 
There's one in Fairfax and one in Falls Church. Every single one of these libraries before FCPL was established and afterwards were segregated. Only white citizens could use these libraries. In 1939, when FCPL was established, they did quickly agree to offer service to all black citizens of the county. However, books allocated for black residents could not be used by white residents, and books allocated for white residents couldn't be used by black residents. FCPL also only provided two bookmobile stops. They're actually deposit stations for the black community. Whereas if you were white, you could access the bookmobile at 46 different stops. You could actually go onto the bookmobile. You, the bookmobile would stop at your school and you had all of those access points. The library was built as a small cinder block building behind the Fairfax Courthouse. It opened in 1940 and it wasn't exactly what we think of as a library today. It essentially was just a office for the librarian and for the book collection to house that. And on the right there, you could see there's a garage and that's where the bookmobile was housed. It was that little van bus looking structure or vehicle and it had the books on the side and there's these panels and it would go driving throughout the county and stop at different businesses and general stores and, and whatnot. The two segregated bookmobile deposit stations were in, there was one in Fairfax and one in Falls Church. We unfortunately don't know where the locations were. Um, we hope to find that someday, but in the library board minutes and the records that we have, it just doesn't mention it. Even more tragic, in the mid-1940s, FCPL stopped these two book deposit stations altogether. So there was no library access at all if you were black and living in Fairfax County for a period of years. It wasn't until 1954 when this little library building expanded and became an actual library it is when it quietly desegregated along with the opening of the first branch, which was Thomas Jefferson Library. Um, up on the left there, that's Mrs. Dora Lee Johnson. As far as we could tell, she is the first black employee hired at FCPL in 1957. She was hired as a custodian at the Fairfax branch and she spent a lot of time doing library work as well. She did book mending and she also did a lot of book deliveries to the Thomas Jefferson branch. The first library aide and page that were hired that were black wasn't until 1963. So how many of you have been to Patrick Henry Library? How many of you have heard of William McKinley Carter? Well, that's a, that's a good, good turnout. I had never heard of William McKinley Carter until we started doing the research for this book. And he and the Carter family are largely responsible for why we have a Patrick Henry Library today. So Carter was a prominent lifelong resident of the town of Vienna and a descendant of the Carter family that had lived in neighboring Freedom Hill since 1847, I'm sorry, 1842. Carter attended the Vienna Colored School, which was a one-room schoolhouse. It did not have a well. So he and the other boys would have to carry water to the school in a bucket retrieved from a nearby spring. Imagine doing that today. Now, after a brief stint in the army during World War I, at age 24, he got a job with the Internal Revenue Service in Washington, DC, and stayed there for 37 years. He was president of the Citizens Progressive Association of Vienna, and a charter member of the Fairfax County branch of the NAACP. When Carter lived in Vienna, the only library, only library in the area was the Vienna Town Library, which had been built in 1897. It was managed by a board of trustees called the Vienna Library Association. The library's 1912 charter, which is on file today at the Fairfax County Courthouse, specifically recorded that its use was restricted to only the town's white inhabitants. So Carter, was not allowed to use this library, even though he lived less than a mile away from. In later years, some members of the Vienna Library Association did not agree with the whites only policy and were concerned that the town's black citizens, particularly black children, did not have library access. So in 1946, a few members donated books and helped create a library for adults in the Vienna Colored School, which is today known as Louise Archer Elementary School. And you could access the library books there very briefly. It was a short-lived enterprise, but the bookmobile did 
go to this branch in the 1950s for a period of time as well. So that's um, Louise Archer Elementary. That building still exists today. It's actually encased in the, the President's School. Um, there's actually a cool little like cut out in the school where you could see the original clapboard structure. And that's uh, uh, Louise Archer, for you, those of you who don't know, uh, she was a principal of the school and that's her uh, 1940s Buick in front of the, the school there. In 1957, Carter retired from the IRS and it was around this time that a shocking incident occurred between his children and the Vienna Town Library. A white woman, unaware of the town library's segregationist rules, checked out books from the library for Carter's children who got to bring them home with them. Once the library board of trustees found out that the Carter children had the book, they went to his house and demanded them back. Wendell Carter, one of those children, later recalled, quote, once the board of trustees found out we had books, they came and took them back. That kind of perturbed my dad and some friends. Another of Carter's children, Maurice Carter, who was active in civic affairs, attended a Vienna Town Council meeting on June 6, 1955, seeking support for the Vienna Lions Little League baseball team. During the meeting, the Vienna Library Association asked the council for its annual contribution for the Vienna Town Library, something it had been doing for nearly half a century. Now, this isn't recorded in the Vienna Town Council minutes, but based on recollections after 20 years later, Carter is remembered to have stood up and objected to the donation, demanding that the Vienna Library Association change its library charter to serve all residents of the town. The Vienna Town Council approved the contribution anyways. In 1958, disgruntled citizens met in William Carter's living room and formally established the Friends of the Library of Vienna, Virginia. It was a biracial organization and Carter was elected as the Friends treasurer. The Friends attempted to work with the existing Vienna Town Library, but when it quickly became apparent that they weren't going to change their ways because they were so rooted to their segregationist policies, the Friends contacted Fairfax County Public Library in hopes of courting them to have a branch opened up in the county, in, in the town of Vienna. As by then, FCPL was already desegregated and serving everyone. After tremendous enthusiastic support from the community and even the Vienna Town Council, and lots of fundraising from the Vienna community, the Patrick Henry Library Branch opened in a shopping center storefront in April 1962. That is the lease signing ceremony in front of the not yet finished library. That's William Carter in the background there. And does anybody know what this, what's in this library space today in the shopping center? You got it, it's Popeyes. <laughs> Did anybody go to the old storefront library? Yeah, yeah, one person. <laughs> Subsequently, Carter received a letter of commendation in 1963 from Vice President Hubert Humphrey for his work with his years-long efforts to encourage and enable blacks to vote in Northern Virginia. And he received the Vienna Citizen of the Year Award in 1969. The Friends dedicated a special bookshelf at the Patrick Henry Library storefront in his and his wife Lillian's honor in a ceremony on November 17th, 1968. And that's what this image is from. The shelf was a designated space for gift books presented to the library. And that's Mr. Carter there in the middle. On the right, that's his sister-in-law. Uh, Lillian had already passed on by this point. On the left, that is the Friends president, Ross Netherton. The shelf no longer exists, as well as the, the storefront library, but at least one book from that shelf made its way to the Virginia Room. We have it in our collection today. This is a book plate, Mrs. Catherine Brand, who was president of the Friends for a period of time, uh, donated this book in honor of Mr. and Mrs. William Kinley Carter. Eventually, the library moved out of the storefront and the permanent Patrick Henry Library opened in its present location in 1971. That's Carter there in the middle there during the opening day ceremonies. He died in 1977 at age 81, but a portrait of him and his wife Lillian hangs in the library's meeting room to this day. And with the Patrick Henry Library renovations, Building a brand new library, what a great opportunity to incorporate some sort of signage or some, something to, 
tell the story of how he made this library possible. Back to Suzanne to wrap it up with Loudoun County. Is this one better? Oh, yeah, yeah. okay. <laughs> um, we couldn't um, do this presentation without showing you one of our favorite photos from the book. Uh, this is Samuel Cardoza Murray and his wife, Josephine Cook Murray, and their little son, uh, Keith, Samuel Keith Murray, in 1950, and they are responsible for desegregating the Percival Public Library, which was the only public library in Loudoun County at the time. Mr. and Mrs. Murray were upholsterers. They had an upholstery shop in Percival, and they were well known for the quality of their work. So one day in 1956, they received a commission from President Eisenhower's sister-in-law, Mrs. Mike Moore, who lived nearby in Hillsborough. And they went over to the Percival Public Library to do some research on the particular type of Austrian window shades that she wanted for her home. But they were not permitted to check out a book due to their race. So Mr. Murray decided to take legal action, and um, his wife supported him. He said, if I did not pay my taxes, they would sell my home. Well, since I do pay my taxes, I felt like I should have the use of a book from the library, which is paid for by my taxes. So it should have been an open and shut case because of that 1946 law saying that libraries receiving state aid must be serving all residents. The Percival Library did not have a bookmobile stop for black residents or services in the main branch. So clearly they were not abiding by the law. Nevertheless, several attorneys turned them down and didn't want to be involved in a civil rights case. But finally, um, they uh, received representation from Mr. Oliver Stone of Alexandria, who reminded the library board of their obligation to be serving all residents. And in 1956, 1957, actually, the library board voted to uh, desegregate the library because their funding was at stake. But segregationists in Loudoun County didn't let that matter drop easily. They vowed to close the library or move it to private ownership simply to avoid integration. But after much drama, more about that in the book, the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors did vote to fund the library in 1957, and that was the first victory of the civil rights movement in Loudoun County. So the Murrays were free to go and head with their design project for uh, Mrs. Moore, and the Eisenhowers, when they visited the Moore's home, were so impressed with the draperies that the Murrays had created that they asked the Murrays to create window treatments and other furnishings for their home near Gettysburg. So if you go visit the Eisenhower National Historic Site in Gettysburg, you'll see these Austrian-style window treatments in nearly every room of the home. And the library, uh, Percival Library, still exists as part of the Loudoun County Public Library System. That's it on the left. Uh, Chris and I are hoping that maybe they will hang up that beautiful portrait of the Murray family. In the, they do have a proclamation hanging in the library about the, um, the Murray's uh, work desegregating the library, but we would like them to hang, hang up that beautiful picture too, so maybe they will do that. Uh, just a brief word about what about the rest of Virginia and um, how uh, this all fits into the civil rights movement in general. Um, just one example from elsewhere in Virginia is in Petersburg, uh, Reverend Wyatt T. Walker and other reverends uh, succeeded in desegregating the Petersburg Public Library in 1960. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was so impressed with Reverend Wyatt Walker's work on this um, um, issue that he asked uh, Reverend Walker to become his chief of staff. So as you can see in this cover from Jet Magazine, he was referred to as the man behind Martin Luther King. He went on to plan many of the um, events that we associate Dr. King with today. So just a little link there between the desegregation of Virginia libraries and the National Civil Rights Movement. Um, also, Teresa Ann Walker, the wife of Reverend Walker, still lives in Virginia today. She was also involved in the desegregation of that library. And she was a freedom writer, and she gave a um, interview to the Washington Post uh, just about a year ago. So I think it's important to re to realize that um, you know this was not ancient history. There are still people alive today who were involved in in these activities and these protests, and um, Mrs. Walker is one of them. Um, the former Petersburg Library is currently being repurposed as a Black History Museum. So. In the book, we, have, um, we also have a whole very lengthy chapter about Falls Church 
and um, Prince William County is included. We have examples from elsewhere in Virginia and um, a chapter about Washington, D.C. and how it fit in as a vital resource for our Northern Virginia scholars. Uh, we go into some analysis of topics such as the implicit versus explicit segregation issue, um, talk about public libraries versus school libraries and how they worked together or how people sometimes when they didn't have access to a public library, they would use a school library, but also the public libraries often su supplied the school libraries with books, so there's a lot of um, overlap there. Um, there's over 100 photos in the book, um, which many of which have never been published before, and most of the research in the book is derived from local archives and hasn't been published before. Author proceeds um, are going to benefit the Fairfax County NAACP, and I hope maybe we have time for some questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your interest in, in this topic. And thank you for being here. Quite a story, huh? Um, we do have some time for questions because this is being um, video recorded. Uh, we do need to have the questions asked in the mic. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic to you. I will say there, there are two relatives of William Carter here, uh, Dee Dee Carter and, and Gloria Runyon. I don't know if, if you guys want to reminisce about William Carter. Or <laughs> <laughs> so I did have one question. As I was reading your book um, in the Vienna section, that's the one I read most closely, by the way, um, the name of Kenton Kilmer uh, was mentioned. Um, my kids went to Green Hedges School, so the Kilmers are, are known to me, but you might want to just comment on essentially the role that uh, Kenton Kilmer played in, in the desegregation of Vienna's libraries. So Kenton Kilmer, uh, for those of you who don't know, was the son of Joyce Kilmer, who was the famous poet, and he was actually the one, with, he was the first president of the Vienna Friends of the Library, and him and Carter partnered together to spearhead the moment of encouraging the community to fundraise it, um, reaching out to the Vienna Town Council, reaching out to just about everyone, and drummed up support for getting the library to become a reality. Uh, he originally reached out to the state library, asking them, like, hey, this Vienna Town Library is segregated. Like, we, we want brand service, but the town library, it's not, it's just not doing it for us. And so the head of the extension division of the library was like, reach out to Fairfax County Public Library. And so Kenton Kilmore was the one who did that. And that's why we have Patrick Henry Library, because of his, his efforts and William Carter's and the whole community. It was a really a community effort to make it a reality. Thanks. I just went to, I'm sorry, may I? I'm one of the relatives of Mr. Carter. We called him Mr. Buck. I just wanted to say the library wasn't his only issue. Mm -hmm. uh, many blacks during that time were very political. We met about poll tax. We met about the bird machine. He was very active for equity, not just equality. So this was not just his goal, but just making Vienna a better place to live. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, Gloria. Anybody else? Going once? Going twice? If not, I'd like to introduce Supervisor Walter Elkhorn, who's going to basically have a few remarks about part two of our program. Oh, wait, we have one more question. Actually, I just wanted to put, I'm sorry. Um, I'm Deb Smith-Cohen from Patrick Henry Library, and I wanted to put in a plug because we have a bookmark in honor of the Carters that will be here and also at the branch. So if you're interested in having um, an image of that painting and a little more history, perhaps, and a bookmark, um, go and grab one. Thanks, Deb. OK, Supervisor Walter Alcorn, who have a few things to say before we take a look and I haven't seen these yet, of the concepts for the new Patrick Henry Library. All right, thank you very much, Chuck. I, uh, I'm gonna see if I can take it off this stand, this microphone, <laughs> let's see if that'll work. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is, I, I just wanna thank um, library staff. Uh, Chris, Suzanne, you guys just did a fantastic job. Thank you so much. Let's give them another round of applause. You know, I, I, I think we really did this right tonight because, you know, we started with history 
and now we're going to be talking a little bit about the future. Um, and they are connected. <laughs> Let's not forget that. The one thing I, I do want to just uh, more on a personal note, um, I'm, I'm so pleased that that we are and that our our folks are documenting this history and, and making it so available. Um, my uh, family actually has some history involving desegregation in Virginia, not with the library system, but with the schools, uh, specifically in Chesterfield County, where my father was the school superintendent during the 1960s and desegregated the Chesterfield County schools. And that, uh, uh, you know, I've wondered how much of that history uh, has been lost. Uh, and perhaps in Northern Virginia and in Fairfax County and perhaps future Liberty Amendment uh, years, um, this is something we can look at a little more closely, at, at least on the school side. But this is such a wonderful, wonderful example of how uh, our history informs us and frankly enriches our present and also gives us a really good uh, firm foundation upon which to move forward. So thank you again so much for this. Um, I want to talk just a little bit more about history, <laughs> pardon me, uh, before we get to the, uh, the unveiling of the, of the new Patrick Henry Library. Um, as was mentioned, I believe, during the presentation, the Patrick Henry Library uh, did initially open in 1971. Uh, it has undergone one renovation during the 1990s. Um, and as we've heard, there was a community library, a town-supported library, uh, that goes back to 1897, but uh, 1971 was the start of this library. So it, it has been referred to uh, over the years as the Vienna Library, uh, and it has been really a mainstay for so many uh, folks here in town and the surrounding areas. So tonight you're going to see design plans for the new Patrick Henry Library, which was conceived in collaboration between Fairfax County and the town of Vienna. And it's gonna be a new and much larger library facility, and it's gonna have structured parking for both community and library purposes. I really like the old slide of the first Fairfax County Library, the fact that it had a parking space in it. <laughs> You know, I, that's so appropriate in so many levels. Um, so, but truly, in this case, and we're going to see this, uh, there are extra spaces, parking spaces designed into the garage to help with some of the parking challenges in the, in the immediate area. So, uh, county residents approved a $90 million do, uh, bond, $90 million bond in support of libraries back in 2020. So, and that library bond did include more than $23 million just for this facility. So the new library will increase the usable public space from the current 13,000 square feet to approximately 20,000 square feet and still all on a single level, a single floor. The library will see its available parking spaces double, almost double, to 125 and the town will gain an additional 80 or so spots uh, for community members looking to shop, walk, recreate, and move along the uh, Maple Avenue corridor. So I, I do want to do a specific shout out to the town for being such great partners uh, in this effort. It really has been a, a wonderful collaboration. Um, the town council uh, has supported portions of the design costs for the project. Uh, as well as for the extra parking spaces in the garage. And the county's very grateful for their continued dedication uh, to library services, uh, the community and, and library parking needs, and to the residents of Vienna. Uh, I also want to thank, and we're going to hear from some folks here, uh, the staff in Capital Facilities. Uh, that's the department of the county, uh, the Department of Public Works, uh, who really have pulled this together and, and gotten us to where we are today. And I also want to thank the county library staff uh, for all the, the work and the input and the insight uh, that is going to make this new library a real shining star, uh, not just across uh, Vienna, not just across the county, but really across the Commonwealth. So this is going to be your opportunity to hear more about uh, the design process, the actual design, 
And uh, there will also be an opportunity, I believe, to share uh, share uh, your thoughts and, and hopes and any questions that you might have um, with the staff as, as they begin finalizing uh, this work. So your feedback is very welcome. And I do appreciate everyone here, again, not just uh, hearing about the past, but now looking to the future. And I do, if you haven't gotten a copy of this book, this is a really good book that we just heard about. So the desegregating, uh, desegregation in Northern Virginia libraries. So now at this point, um, I'll turn it over. Miriam, if you, you guys want to take it over and, and we're going to see some slides. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Supervisor Alcorn um, and uh, Councilman. Oh, closer. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity uh, for us to present the uh, Patrick Henry Library um, this evening. I'm Miriam Mustamandi. I'm the project manager uh, working for the Department of Public Works and uh, Environmental Services of Fairfax County uh, Building Design Branch, and uh, been assigned this. Wonderful project, really exciting. Um, so I, I will be talking uh, about the um, general background um, and just some, some background information about the, the project. And then um, my colleague uh, Keith Leonard uh, from RMM Architects will be uh, talking about the, um, the actual plans and elevations of the project. So uh, the uh, project um, consists of the replacement of the existing library with a state-of-the-art expanded um, a new library and a parking garage. And 2019-2020, uh, 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 the uh, uh, Fairfax County Board of Supervisors in the town of uh, Vienna um, started talking about the um, a partnership in funding the uh, garage garage portion of the library, um, and uh, that's how the whole feasibility study started, and um, and we kicked off the project. The project has um, great sustainability goals. Um, this project will um, will be a net zero building. Uh, will achieve LEED Gold certification. 50% energy reduction, um, and this building will be all electric. Um, we are moving away from um, fossil fuel uh, powered um, systems in, in Fairfax County um, uh, buildings. As you all know, the location of the project is uh, 101 Maple Avenue. It's a very prominent corner of Maple and uh, Center Street. The site itself is 1.43 acres. It's a really small site. Um, and um, we are trying to fit a very large program within that very small um, site. Um, in, and one of the great amenities right in front of it is, is a, it's the it's a bus stop right there so for commuters to take the bus and the the existence of the garage in the future is going to be a great help for the commuters um, and also this site has an access to the um, Vienna Elementary School so the school uh, is right next to the to our site and um, as uh, um, we have agreed with the um, uh, Fairfax County Public Schools to maintain that site um, uh, to to the uh, uh, to uh, maintain the access to to the uh, back of the um, Vienna Elementary School. So these are some of the challenges of the of this project um, and uh, um, just a little bit of background. Um, I'm not going to go too far into the background of the existing library because we covered that already. Um, but yeah, so. It was uh, built in 1971 and then re renovated and expanded in 1995. And uh, currently it's 13,800 square feet. Um, and um, it only offers about 60 plus surface parking lots. Um, you've probably all seen how, you know, on peak times, what a nightmare it is to, to park on, this, on that um, site. Um, 
the building itself is outdated. Um, the systems need to be um, uh, renewed. And then also the building layout does not allow for um, you know, expansion and the needs of today and future of the libraries. So through the agreement we have with the town of Vienna, in this being a um, collaboration um, um, in partnership, uh, we have been uh, providing updates um, uh, um, at major milestones of this project. And I wanted to go over some of these uh, um, updates that we have been providing. These, these updates have been uh, provided uh, during public uh, meetings during council uh, meetings and also during the uh, presentation to the um, Board of Architectural Review. So um, I encourage in the future um, uh, meetings for the community members to attend these meetings. Uh, they they are great for you know keeping up with the progress of this project as we are we are moving along. So we have been providing um, uh, an update uh, when we uh, awarded the design contract in uh, um, January of 2022. Then we had a concept design um, introduction in March of uh, 2022, and then we went back to the council as well uh, uh, in May of uh, 2022. Uh, then we, um, uh, updated the concept. So this this is all the the different the the process of uh, concept design that we worked with the with the town council and with the Department of uh, Public Works and Zoning of via Vienna. Um, and then uh, we had a concept update, and then we also presented the exterior design to the Board of Architectural Review in September of 2022, and we uh, received valuable um, uh, feedback from, uh, from the uh, Board of Architectural Review, and we also learned a lot about the architecture of Vienna and how to incorporate some of the, um, the features um, and make the, the building fit within um, the town. And uh, and then again, we had another work session with the uh, Board of Architectural Review. And this will continue also in the future based on the agreement we have on certain milestones. We will be uh, presenting the updates to the uh, town council. And um, the town council has the option to vote on continuing their partnership or to exit, but we're hoping this project is really exciting for both for um, um, for uh, Fairfax County and for the Vie for Vienna to continue and have this uh, project become realized. So next steps um, for this project um, is to um, to update the, the the town council on the details of this project in September of this year. Then uh, we will um, submit the, the design to the Board of Architectural Review for their um, approval. This is part of the regulatory steps of the, of the project. Then um, we also have submitted the plan, uh, the site plan to the Zoning and Planning um, Department and they are reviewing it currently. Next step will be to go uh, to, uh, through the Zoning and Planning uh, Commission uh, review process, and then uh, we will um, uh, uh, the 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 project will be uh, the design of the the uh, project will be completed in the summer of 2024. So right now we're in the design development uh, phase of it, which means we're we're uh, putting the building together in terms of details and um, uh, making the what the ideas were work in a building. Um, we will be uh, bidding the, the project in the summer of 2024. This is an open bid process. And uh, construction will start in the fall of 2024. The project completion is scheduled for the fall of 2026. So it takes about 24 months to 
um, to build this library in the garage. And during the construction of the uh, library, uh, we will be providing a temporary facility within Vienna, and uh, uh, Jessica will be talking about that uh, later a little bit more. Um, and this, this uh, library facility is also part of this project, so we're, we're right now working on um, renovating a space for, for this um, temporary facility. This, this was the, uh, the general portion of the, uh, of the presentation. I encourage uh, you to um, provide your feedback and your questions uh, in writing um, in case we don't get to all your questions. There's a, at, at the table over there, there's a box uh, with um, uh, cards. You can, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the box. And we will be looking at all the questions and um, uh, try to address everything that has been uh, asked of us. So um, I will give a hand over to, Thank you. to Keith. Good evening. Um, Keith Leonard with RRMM Architects. And uh, it's just a thrill to be here. We've been involved in this process for uh, a little over a year now. And it's really exciting to see how far we've all come from a little one-room library, half of which was a garage for Bookmobile, to what we're going to show you tonight. Um, so let me just get started. Um, what we're proposing for the site that Miriam talked about, and I, I, let me just orient everyone, because uh, th this image is a little bit different than the orientation than the one she showed. So Maple Avenue, Center Street, the uh, elementary school is back here. Uh, and then about a block up is the WNOD trail. We're sitting in a building sort of over here. So um, we've gone through a lot of iterations of how to put the parts of this building on this site. Where we've ended up with is with the library, a one-story building out in front, anchoring the corner of Center Street and Maple Avenue with an entrance right here on Maple Avenue. Um, entrances to the garage off of Center Street and off of an aisle we've created here. Um, this allows us to maximize the footprint. There's just a lot of stuff that has to get packed onto this site, uh, as you can imagine. Um, we're going to have, as, as uh, Miriam alluded, we're going to have a net zero building. So the top of this garage is going to be covered with solar panels. We'll show you some images of that in a minute. Um, we are going to continue the tree planting on Maple Avenue. We're going to have seating along Maple Avenue and a nice um, plaza that we'll show you in some subsequent slides here. Um, the parking garage, as has been stated, is going to have 209 spots. 125 of those are going to be devoted to the library and the rest for the town. And one of the things that um, right now, you come in and you have access to the school. You sort of come across the back of the site and you can get up into the school uh, property here. We have to maintain that access, but because the garage has to be a certain width, we're now going to access the school from a drive aisle that we're going to create on this side of the site here. So here's a little bit more detailed uh, building plan and garage plan. And you can see uh, what I talked about. There's the main entry off of Maple Avenue into the library here. There's a vehicular entry off of Center Street uh, right here. There's a vehicular entry off of this drive aisle right here. This is a four-level parking garage. And when you park, you can either, if you're on this level, the first level, you can come right in. So there's a door from the garage. There's a door from Maple Avenue. You can also come down one of two stairs here and here or down an elevator. So here's a more enlarged plan of just the library itself. Um, you can see, again, you're coming in off of Maple or you're coming in from the parking garage. There's a lobby, and 
in that lobby, you, you can go one of two ways. You can go into the library proper, which sort of is starts right here and is all of this space that you see here. Or uh, this area over here is all the public meeting space, a conference room and a large multi-purpose room. And then this is the staff area of the library here and public restrooms. The library itself is divided into sort of the adult area with adult collections back here, study tables, computer carrels, a circulation desk that greets you right as you come in the door. Uh, so that allows the staff to really monitor what's going on. This whole wall that you're seeing here is glass, so they can also see who's coming in to the lobby from the garage, who's coming in from the public plaza, uh, and it gives them a great control over what's going on there. We also have quiet study rooms, some small, what we call huddle rooms for three to four people that want to have meetings. We have a teen room, which is a big draw these days in libraries. And um, this children's seating area, sort of just very nice, relaxing, soft seating, a lot of natural light, a lot of glass uh, along both Maple Avenue and Center Street. One of the things I want to point out is that um, sometimes you have after hours programs in these meeting rooms. And you want to be able to keep that going while the library is closed. So what can happen is these doors can be locked. This lobby, the restrooms, and all this meeting space can be open after hours or on a weekend and can be used by the public. And people can't get in and you know, do mischief in the library. Um, Let's go here. So just real quickly, um, these are some elevational drawings. They're just sort of as if you were standing across Maple Avenue looking at the building. The library itself is this lower part in the front. Again, this library is one story. And we really looked at how we could make that fit on the site because a one-story library is much easier to staff and run than a two-story or a three-story library. So in terms of how much it costs to make this library work day to day, a one-story library is much more efficient. And in the background, you begin to see the parking garage structure. And there are those solar panels that are up on top. This is what it would look like if you're standing in that gas station on the other side of Center Street. So you're seeing the garage, and you're seeing the library, and that's the canopy over the main entrance there. Here are some day and night images of what the corner of Maple Avenue and Center Street would look like. And you can see this really nice glass prow, if you will, uh, that sort of anchors the corner. At night, it's lit up. It's very welcoming. You can see the activity that's going on in the library. It enlivens the street. There's lots of uh, seating and trees and a really nice streetscape that we've developed. Um, and it just um, really serves to anchor the street and make it a welcoming place. We've got some interior images that we're going to show you. And I do want to just say that these are very preliminary. We haven't assigned colors or materials to a lot of these. So when you see a lot of white walls, don't worry. We're getting there. Um, but this is the view of the lobby. This is as if you had just come in from the... Um, from the parking garage, and that's the door that goes back out to Maple Avenue. That's the entry to the library, and then the corridor that goes back to the meeting rooms is right here. This is inside the library. This is that children's area on the corner that I talked about, and you're looking back toward the entrance. There's a lot of glass along Maple Avenue, a lot of natural light. We actually have what are called solo tubes in the roof that are gonna bring natural light down into the center of that space, all in an effort to reduce the amount of uh, electric light we need and help us get to that net zero goal. This is a view sort of standing in the library, looking toward the corner of Maple and Center. That's that glass prow. This is the children's seating area and just some fun ceiling effects, we're working on those. <laughs> and here's a view as if you've just come in the door. There's the circ desk. 
There's Jessica greeting you. <laughs> and this sort of nave of natural light that takes you and leads you back to the children's area, the adult collection here on the left, adult seating here on the right. And again, just beautiful tall windows and views out to uh, Maple Avenue. So here's an um, aerial view, if you will, from sort of across the corner. You can see that, that um, corner feature that I talked about. The Maple Avenue entrance is here. We're going to see an image of that in a minute. But you can see the one-story building, the solar tubes, the garage beyond, the solar collectors on the, on the roof of the garage that are going to help us get to net zero. And just an idea of how this all fits into the context uh, of your town. This is a view from the north uh, as you're looking at the corner. This is the um, meeting room. So again, a lot of natural light in that meeting room, a lot of views to the outside, active streetscapes, um, a lot of plantings, maintaining trees, seating along Maple Avenue, just very exciting and enlivened streetscape. And we're going to end with this image, which is the main entry off of Maple Avenue. And we really envision this as an outdoor plaza, a place to gather before you come into the library, a place to meet people, a place to sit with a book or a cup of coffee or whatever. A place where a group of children could come out and have story hour if you wanted to do that. Just another civic space within your town for people to gather and enjoy being together and being in the library and using all the resources that the library has to offer. Um, so I think that's the last slide. And Jessica, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. Extra claps, yes. <laughs> so I get to do closing remarks, which I know no one wants to hear because you want to ask questions, so they will be brief. But I do feel uh, required to, to share with you all. Keith mentioned earlier, you know, the color and design, not quite nailed down yet. Uh, one of the things I heard loud and clear from community members is the color of the brick on the exterior of the building matters has not been decided yet, so that debate can continue onward, whatever color brick you all want. But truthfully, we're just so excited to partner with the town, the county, and our community members to envision this new Patrick Henry Library. I am sure many of you are regular library users, and you have been there alongside staff as we have had uh, building infrastructure issues where the HVAC has gone down, or you couldn't find parking, or you know, name your own item. Our county does an amazing job of using every last day of usable energy out of the facilities that we have before we bond fund them for renovation. And this facility is certainly at the end of its usable life cycle. So it's wonderful that we're able to partner with the town to offer not only a library, but a parking garage that can service community members as you are using your spaces here on Maple Avenue. Um, Thank you all for being here and participating today. I will echo what Miriam said earlier. We have opportunities for written feedback, so there are comment cards on the table there, as well as the two graphic posters here. But you also have time for feedback now, so Q&A is open for, for our wonderful folks over there from County Cat Facilities or from our Architects RRMM, for myself if you have questions about the library and what it means, and just a brief plug about a temporary library. Uh, we tend to plan to have temporary facilities to bridge the gap for the time period between when a facility closes and when it reopens. We do plan that for Vienna. Uh, we are currently in very early stages of looking at facilities and identifying spaces that might work for you. Temporary libraries are much smaller. They're usually about three to 5,000 square feet and they are meant for quick service only. So it will not have full service capacity like meeting rooms or uh, a lot of bookable spaces. But it will certainly still be here to provide you core services while this beautiful new facility is being built. So we are happy to open it up to questions. Does anyone have one? If so, please raise your hand and Lily will bring you around a microphone. One of the things I've been asking for for years is a drive-up drop box where you wouldn't have to get out of your car and walk over. Any possibility of that? I 
think so. I'm trying to remember where they're placed in the current design. There's one in the garage, but I don't know how easy it is to drive up to at this point. Yes, we're working on that. Um, at the moment, it would be in the garage, so you would have to drive through the garage, drop off, and then exit. Um, but again, that's one of the details that's coming along as we develop these plans. Yeah. You can stay in the air conditioning or heating, weather dependent, uh, just to drop off your book if you need to. Other questions? Hi, I know that the, uh, the previous uh, square footage was 13,800. So what is it now? It's a little under 20,000, 19,800 and pick yes. two digits at the end. Yes, okay. just under yeah. 20,000. Uh, and I'm, I'm just curious too, because this is not, it's still not a regional library. Nope. Correct. But we are the busiest non-regional library. That is accurate. So we obviously pay attention to our usage statistics and Patrick Henry remains very busy for one of our community libraries. For folks who are unaware, our Fairfax County Library System has regional libraries which are typically larger sized, between 25 and 40,000 square feet. They have a larger collection, they're open on Sundays, and they have a larger staffing component. Community libraries usually cap out at around 17 or 18,000 square feet. So we've already squidged it a little bit beyond the size capacity we, we normally would for a community location. And that has certainly been taken into account in the programmatic aspects of the size of the meeting rooms, the number of the small study rooms, the square footage for materials, really just making sure there's a lot of people space. And what about the hours? Are they going to be extended at all? No, so at this point, I would love to get us back to normal operating hours, period. We're, we're inching closer, but it is still anticipated that your facility will remain a community library, not open on Sundays. Sorry. Hi. Um, I actually have two questions. One there, maybe one there. Um, it's beautiful. I love it. It's awesome. I use the library a lot today, and I'm looking forward to this one. Um, the glass that looks into the meeting room and in the children's section, is that clear glass? So somebody, like the kids would see who's standing outside and somebody standing outside would see the kids? Yes. Okay. There, okay. We are planning um, sun shades, solar shades. Okay. That can also be used uh, if privacy or room darkening is needed. Um, but yes, it's clear glass. Now it's hyper efficient, low E, glass you know because of our okay. environmental um demands but okay. yes and same for the meeting room then correct the meeting room would be visible from the street so you could see see in okay second question and this isn't really so much about the building is about the site um is anything going to be done to enhance the crosswalks or because you're you're now parking and expecting people to maybe walk over to church street is anything as part of this plan dealing with the crosswalks getting across Maple Ave? Just where we are impacting traffic signals, you know, where the design of the building is impacting traffic signals and we're having to relocate them, that's, that's the scope of that. Okay. I don't know that we have any, we're not doing any work in that right of ways or in the VDOT. That falls to yeah. on the VDOT yeah. side? Okay, okay, just two concerns, thanks. Other questions? Uh, did you consider adding, putting a green roof on the library portion? We did, we talked a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're trying to do I is <laughs> build this. <laughs> and we're facing you know, uh, financial issues. And one of the things this project will do, it'll use a highly reflective white roof to reduce energy. It's a lot less expensive than a green roof. Um, so it was one of the trade-offs in the design process. Um, a green roof would be wonderful. It reduces stormwater, uh, but it also increases the load on the building, so your structural system gets bigger. So yes, we evaluated that, but we ended up with the, the white reflective energy efficient roof on the library. 
Thank you. Yes, I have a question. Um, the library is, to me, is you're not really enhancing the library from what I see, from what a library should be. Um, why aren't you going up? And then the other question is, I know you have a lot of parking space, but it doesn't look like you're, the, the library is going to be any bigger than what it is today or any thing like that. And then also, um, are you going to have like a reading room for adults as well, where they have also comfort chairs, where they can sit down and read if they want to do that as well? Yes. Well, the library will be about a third again as big as it is today. Um, so just under 14,000 today to about 20,000 uh, when it's done. And yes, the reading room, there's a, a fairly large quiet study room in there which can be used as a reading room, it can be used as a meeting space, it's, a, it's sort of a multifunctional space and the library can determine how they use it on a day to day or even hour by hour basis. Yeah, and I'd be... Yeah. Sure. Yes. I, I will be happy to speak to that a little bit as well. We are always trying to make sure that when we renovate and when we put in new furniture in a facility, it's something that's going to be comfortable and easy to use, easy to clean as well, because we have a lot of people coming in regularly. But part of the goal with this facility, it may not look like in scope it's a lot bigger because those are just those are just pictures to give us an idea of what's to come. But it certainly is expanding the size of the area that we have for teen uses and children's usage. There's plentiful area for the collection that we know the community continues to access with our print materials. And there's definitely, particularly along the windows on Maple Avenue, there's easy seating areas for adults as well for both individual reading purposes and for people who might be working from a laptop or a tablet or their phone. Uh, we tried to make sure that we were taking into consideration the types of uses we see in the current Patrick Henry Library and then expanding on those since we have a third again more size in this new one. You will see though uh, on some of the slides we incorporated things that we know have been incredibly popular in other libraries we've renovated like the enclosed teen space. Instead of having a very small corner with just some books for teens now, we've landed on a model where we have an enclosed room but all the walls are glass so we can see what's going on in there. Uh, but it's noise buff buffering, so you don't have to hear quite as much that's going on there. That's the same reason the children's area is all the way at the end of the space, so that it is a little bit further apart from people who might want a little bit of quiet reading area and tucked away at the farthest part of the library so that they can't just bolt out the front door. Um, one of the challenges that we had with the site, as, as both of my colleagues have said before, is it's really tight and trying to fit everything that we wanted into this space without it turning into a shotgun building has been difficult. Um, but we think we've landed on a model that will maximize the space that we have and all the feedback that you're sharing about whether or not we should have tinted windows or whether or not we should talk about the, the crosswalks with VDOT or if we should look at ensuring that we have just as much easy seating for adults as we put in for children are things that we're gonna try and take into consideration as we finalize these plans. In the, <clears throat> in the garage, the uh, public parking, the non-library patron parking, is there any way to make that paid parking to generate some revenue? There's a way to do that, but that hasn't been decided. The, the, the mechanism of how people use that garage hasn't been decided yet, so. <laughs> just just to add, um, as of now, there is no, um, there will not be any paid parking in, in the garage. I had two questions. Mm. Will you be partnering with Popeyes to put the temporary library in the old storefront at the Vienna Shopping Center? <laughs> if I thought I could pry them out of there, maybe, but <laughs> no, that is not one of the current locations that we've identified for a potential temporary library. Second so question, um, as a librarian, <laughs> I noticed there's just a circulation desk and there's not an information desk, and which they're two completely different things. Is, is there gonna be an information desk? That's there pretty, is, yeah. so for ease of viewing, it's just identified as a circulation desk, but similar to other recent renovations, we have our, our circulation desk, which is materials that you return, if you need to pay for a lost item, 
account questions very closely adjacent to information services where you're asking staff for assistance and looking up information and research. So if you think about Tyson's or John Marshall or POHEC, they're, they're abutting each other. There is a difference in the space. It's likely that they'll just be on two halves of the same desk. Yeah. Good questions. Thank you. Chris is not my plant in the audience, by the way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just had a question about the impact on the neighboring elementary school and also if the mature trees there will be left intact. We are working to leave as many trees along that property line intact as we possibly Between can. Between the school and the library? Yep. yep. Thank you. Okay. If there are no further questions, and I do not see any hands up right now, I'm going to turn it back over to Council Member Chuck Anderson to wrap us up for the afternoon. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jess Jessica. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Mariam. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, Walter. <laughs> thank you, Lily. Thank you, Bard's Alley. I think I've covered most. Uh, this has been, I think, a really successful Liberty Amendments Month event. And I thank you all for coming.